Beyond Life Vineyard online. We are so thankful you have joined us today. Whether you're part of our church on a regular basis or if this is your first time with us, welcome. Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. His promise that he will always be with us. So in these crazy times we are experiencing right now, you've come to the right place to experience God with us. Join in as we worship together and God will meet you right where you are. Let's begin with prayer. God, we are so thankful you are here, that you are in control and that nothing takes you by surprise. Lord, we've come to worship you this morning and to celebrate your goodness. We thank you for your promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for health and strength. Lord, we think of those on the front lines in this battle against this virus, and we ask you for, their, for protection over them, Lord. God, we thank you that you give us life and that you give us hope and peace in these troubled times. You are our fortress. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hope you guys are all doing well. So I'll let you know that everybody in the Ellsworth Commune is fine at this moment. Um, Melt has uh, graciously asked us to read Ephesians 6 for you this morning. So Nadine is going to start us off. By the way, this is about take four right now. <laughs> it's his fault. No, it isn't. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not ex... <laughs> Finish. We're not stopping. Finish the word. Exasperate. There you go. <laughs> your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And this is why we were on take five. Exasperate. <laughs> Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the, the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the Gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. 
Hope you guys have a great Sunday and a wonderful week. Take care and hopefully we're not in lockdown too long and we get to see you soon. Bye. God bless.
Well, good morning to you and welcome to Yellowknife Vineyard Church's online platform during this uncertain and testing time in world history. We've been going together through the book of Ephesians and last week we were in chapter 5 with uh, Relentless Logic. This week we are moving towards chapter 6. Now in the first part of Ephesians chapter 6 we see the continuation of the mutual submission that Paul was calling us to last week in chapter 5. Already in verse 1 of chapter 6, he asks children to obey their parents. And then in verse 4, he asks the same parents not to exasperate their children. I think some of us have an idea of what he's talking about here. He then advises slaves to obey their masters in chapter 6 verse 5. And then in 6 verse 9, he calls upon masters to do exactly the same with their slaves. He's completing the thought that began in chapter 5 verse 21, where all of these relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, slaves and masters, are being unpacked in the light of the ethic of the new humanity that has been created in Christ, where submission is a mutual pursuit. And all of this as an illustration that in Jesus, even the ethics of heaven have visited earth, and so heaven continues to be set onto that collision path with earth that we've been speaking about, and all of that because of what God has accomplished in Jesus. Then in verse 10 of chapter 6, he switches from the theme of mutual submission in relationships to some closing thoughts for the Ephesian church and also for us. And these closing thoughts are, in a, uh, in, in a very real way, a summary of this great cosmic battle that Paul has been speaking of throughout the book of Ephesians. He reverts here to the thoughts that he first expressed in chapter 3, where he was speaking about the cosmic powers at play in the heavenlies, the things that he called powers and authorities. And Paul was very clear in chapter 3 that these powers and these authorities are evil forces that control so much and influence so much of what happens here on earth. He is speaking about an invisible realm that has control over us, whether we recognize that or whether we don't. And again, we see in his thinking the movement between the cosmic, between what I call the communal or the relational, and then also the individual. So there's this continuous relationship between the cosmic powers, how they influence the relational, and how ultimately they even influence the individual. In chapter 3, he tells us about the cosmic battle. And then here in chapter 6, he tells us how to enter that battle against these same powers and authorities. He wants us to know that in this battle, we are not helpless spectators. There's a way in which we can get involved in the battle. So Paul's closing thoughts here uh, are to remind us uh, ourselves that many of the powers and the authorities that he's speaking of are still prevalent in this day. And in his own day, many of the powers that he was speaking of or referring to were very much still in the seat of power at the time that he's writing this. And obviously the most notable of those would have been the Roman authorities at that particular time. He's telling the Ephesians in no uncertain terms as he's telling us 
that despite appearances, despite what we think we see around us, it is actually God who is in control, and it is ultimately God who has the power. In chapter 6, God is revealed as the divine warrior who fights the cosmic battle on behalf of the people who bear his name, on behalf of the people who entrust their lives to his covenant faithfulness. Now, that would be us. The battle is his, it's not ours. But we, as his name bearers, ally us ourselves to him in this battle. And, and that's what the, the remainder of chapter 6 is really all about. How we go about allying ourselves to God in the battle that is ultimately his. Of course, the truth of God's care and protection and the heavenly battle uh, was known under the Old Covenant for sure. You can look to Exodus chapter 15 and Daniel chapter 10 to see some hints of that. But now under this new covenant, we have a far clearer perspective on spiritual warfare, especially insofar as us being called to align ourselves, to ally ourselves on the Lord's side against the enemy and his minions. He wages this war. I'm going to say again, the battle is his, but we need to decide on which side of the battle we align ourselves. And Paul explains here in chapter 6 in some detail how we are to go about equipping ourselves to participate in the spiritual battle and to align ourselves to the kingdom of God correctly. In 6 verses 10 to 12, he reminds us that our struggles with sin and with the kingdom of darkness and with opposition, and with persecution, and even our struggles with people sometimes, when we think they're setting themselves up against God, are not ultimately battles against flesh and blood, but are ultimately battles against the evil one who has set himself up in heavenly places. And he's sharing all of this with the Ephesians in the context, and this is very important, in the context of them being a city in the occupied Roman province of Asia Minor. And it's pretty obvious that he has some of that occupation in mind as he teaches the church how to engage in this battle, which is very clear is a spiritual battle, not a physical one. So what, what does the church look like in battle? Because over years this has been misunderstood. Well, for the church, having been reconciled to God through or in Jesus Christ, here we are again with some of Paul's in Christ thinking and in Christ lists, we no longer have Satan as the captain of our souls. Because of what God has accomplished in Christ, we now serve a new captain, and our captain's name is Jesus. Now, of course, we all well know that the old us doesn't just disappear uh, when we come to Christ because of the world and because of our old human natures and because of the evil one. Uh, and all of these things strive daily to make us forget whose side we are actually on as servants of the cross. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 5. So Christians in the West and in the global North um, might find it difficult when I come to this concept of spirits waging war against the people called by God's name. Uh, some people might even see it as antiquated superstition. Well, I, I, I would like to say that sometimes I wish that the spiritual world was antiquated superstition. Things might be a little easier if that were the case. But the sacred text, the scriptures, and my experience in ministry tell me that Paul is scarily accurate here. Satan and his minions march upon us who bear the name of Jesus daily. The spiritual world is very, very real. And the forces that march against us on a daily basis are very, very real. C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said there are two equal mistakes that we as human beings make about the devil. The one is to believe that he doesn't exist. And that is very prevalent in the West and the global North. The other is to give him far too much attention. And either mistake suits the evil one's purposes just fine because both mistakes skew emphasis and keep people from trusting God. Now, I as a pastor am equally concerned about Christians who are obsessed with the dark side as I am about Christians who poo-poo its existence. 
we are not demon hunters. Well, certainly I'm not a demon hunter. But when we do come across the kingdom of darkness as we do, and the demonic, which is not that infrequently, we deal with it in the authority of Jesus, which is imparted to us as those who bear his name. The only way effectively, says Paul, to keep us from inadvertently turning against the way of Jesus and finding ourselves acting inadvertently as traitors to his cause is to continually put on the uniform that identifies us as his soldiers. And that you see from verses 13 to 17. It's the family uniform. Put it on and wear it daily. Put it on. And wear it. And Paul, in once again describing the family resemblance here, uses the analogy of a Roman soldier's full armor to illustrate the armor of faith. And and people don't really use military analogies much anymore because it's a reminder of an historical time uh, when the church, certainly the institutional church, was involved in waging war and quite rightly. Uh, we really don't want to be reminded of that. It's, it's not a good time in the church's history. But the military illustration is a good one. It serves a good purpose. And I think it's very helpful to look at the reason why each particular piece of armor, the sword, the shield, the sandals, uh, is linked to a specific spiritual characteristic. It's probably more important for us to see that the roots of Paul's thinking go right back to the Old Testament here. I think usually a teaching on spiritual warfare would go into some detail on uh, what each weapon does in the spiritual realm, so to speak. Uh, I don't have the time to do that. I want to focus today rather on the bigger picture. One of the reasons is that these online teachings are a little shorter than I would ordinarily teach in a congregational setting. So I'm going to encourage you to study that little piece about each weapon in your own time. Uh, I need to try and keep the main thing the main thing, so to speak. So for today's purposes, it's sufficient for you to recognize that some of the weapons Paul speaks of, like, for example, the shield, are defensive, and others, like the sword, are are offensive. So in your own time, go through those, have a look at each weapon and how he instructs us to put those on. I want to move back to the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 59, from about verse 15, The prophet speaks of God wearing exactly the same kind of armor as Paul is calling us to dress ourselves in to take up a battle against Satan. Putting on our spiritual armor ultimately simply means that we continually clothe ourselves in Jesus, relying on his gifts, relying on his graces to stand firm in our faith and to enable us to risk even our own well-being Uh, and, And sometimes even our lives, when and if it were to come to that, for the sake of the kingdom. Just like so many in the persecuted church are doing all over the world right now. And again, sometimes the global north and the west stands ignorant of what is actually happening all over the world. And the price that Christians are actually paying in various places in the world just to worship Jesus freely. So for us, continuing in the spiritual disciplines and the ancient paths like scripture reading or what it was called in the ancient days, Lectio Divina, uh, things like meditation, fasting, study, worship, silence, solitude, praise and more, the spiritual disciplines, all of these things ultimately root us in prayer. And these are the things that equip us by the Spirit, both for ourselves and also for the needs of the world. We are right now in a time like the historical time we're in, in March 2020, in the world. We, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are the hope of the world. You are the hope of the world. You are the hope of the world to your neighbor. You are the hope of the world to your disbelieving spouse, to your friends who are not churched, who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You are that hope. And in doing these spiritual things, Paul speaks of how it is that we put on this armor from chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. Then Paul also urges us to pray in the Spirit here. Well, what does that mean? There are differences of opinion. But praying in the Spirit essentially means praying with God's help. 
It's trusting in faith and relying that God will hear, that God will understand and that God will act on our behalves. It's being prompted in regard uh, to what to pray for. Here's the key to praying in the Spirit. It is listening before it is speaking. Praying in the Spirit is a gift to be received through faith in Jesus rather than a skill set to be developed. Sometimes it requires the discipline of just being still, as in dead silent before him. God tends to speak into our silence. Praying in the Spirit is an intrinsic part of the Christian life. Now, as I've said, opinions vary about the exact meaning of praying in the Spirit and their different theological claims about how to achieve prayer in the Spirit, almost as if the admonition from Paul is a skill set to be acquired. But that is to miss the point. Praying in the Spirit is not a skill to be acquired. It is a gift to be received. It is a life to be lived. Prayer with God's help is praying in the Spirit. Now, some of you are asking, well, Melt, is that the same as praying in tongues? Well, mostly no, but also yes. No, it isn't because not everybody has the gift of tongues. Paul is clear about that. But can prayer in the Spirit include praying in tongues? Yes, it can, because praying in tongues is a gift received through faith in Jesus Christ with the help of God. Now, some teach that praying in the Spirit is synonymous with praying in tongues, but it's not. It's similar, but it's different. Whether with or without glossolalia, it is praying with God's assistance, and that requires listening. My own experience says that praying in tongues doesn't really require that much listening. In verse 13, Paul re repeats his exhortation from verse 11 where he emphasizes the need for spiritual strength in order to stand firm. Now, in verse 11, he writes that we are to stand against the schemes of the devil. But here in verse 13, we are to stand so that we may be able to withstand that evil day. Well, which evil day, Paul? There seem to be two kinds of standing required, one against Satan in general and one against a specific day or a specific time of evil. And when I speak of a day or a time of evil right now in March 2020, I think we get an idea of what he's talking about, to be sure. The world is in lockdown and fear and confusion and anxiety are all around us. But what exactly did Paul mean by the term that evil day? In Greek, it's te hemera te ponera. Is it in an eschatological sense? In other words, is it is an, in an end time sense that he's speaking? Or is he referring to a particular instance of temptation to him? Or is he simply referring to everyday life? Well, I think that given the apocalyptic background of the imagery that Paul uses to describe the evil cosmic forces, end time evil likely makes the most sense here. It's very similar to the term that runs throughout both the Old and the New Testaments, uh, the day of the Lord. Paul uses that term in 1 Thessalonians, uh, and he draws from the Old Testament apocalyptic ideas in Isaiah, Joel, and also the prophet Amos. Now, I want you to be reminded again that Paul is writing with the Ephesian context in mind, predominantly, rather than us. So, in a sense, this has nothing to do with COVID-19 or the economic crash of 2008-2009 or 9-1-1 or World War I or World War II or Vietnam or any modern day occurrence for that matter. But in a complete paradox, it also has everything to do with events like these, and wars and rumors of wars and times of strife and struggle throughout the ages. It is Paul speaking an end time exhortation to his readers in their Ephesian present day, as well as to every single Christian everywhere throughout history in whatever their present day is or was and whatever evil that present day held for them. So really, it's Paul speaking an end-time exhortation to his readers in their Ephesian present day, as well as to every single Christian 
everywhere in whatever their present day is and whatever evil that day holds or held for them in their context. It's a word to the church throughout the ages. It's a word that says this, the reality of evil has been with us since forever. And it will be with us until the bridegroom Jesus appears and evil is fully and finally defeated once and for all time. The last days have been with us from the time that Jesus ascended to heaven. And the last days will be with us until he appears again. I want to encourage you as believers to keep on doing what you usually do in as far as you're able to do that given the restrictions that are placed around us. Don't focus elsewhere. Focus on Him. Lean into Him. He is the only certain thing at this time. And the bride, that is us, the body of Christ, does what the bride does until the bridegroom appears. Now, in our little vineyard family, and I, I gather most people who will be watching this are uh, in, in Yellowknife Vineyard Church and some in other vineyard churches and some in other churches. But our little vineyard family, our little tribe within the great uh, body of Christ, um, very much focuses on seeking the good rather than the evil. We, we, we look for evidence of the kingdom wherever we find it. We are kingdom seekers. And where we find it, we bless it. We look for signs of the coming of the kingdom where the future, as it will be one day, has broken into the present. And wherever we find that, rather than focusing on evil per se, we bless it. But that doesn't mean that we are unaware of the evil that surrounds. It's just a different focus. In other words, we are kingdom seekers. Unapologetically, we are kingdom seekers, and we continually seek in the present glimpses of the future as it will be one day when the kingdom is consummated. We purposely focus on and look for the good in society, be the salt, the preservative of what is good in society, and bless it where we find it. But that doesn't mean we aren't light as well. It doesn't mean that we don't draw light to the evil of the day or that we're ignorant of the evil of the day. A particular tribal focus, if I could put it that way, is more inclined to seek the good, though. Kind of that there is some good in this world, Frodo, if you are a follower of Tolkien, which I am, and that it's worth fighting for. That there is some good in this world, Frodo, and that it is worth fighting for. And in this particular time, and in all times of challenge, always, you will see the best and the worst of humanity at play. You will see people rising to the occasion and the best coming out. You'll see also see other people looting and pillaging when they get the opportunity. That is the truth of any evil at play, is it always brings out the best and the worst in humanity, but we want to focus on that there is some good in this world, Frodo, and that it is worth fighting for. So Paul refers in this instance to his own present day as the days that are evil, chapter 5, verse 16, and then in verse 6, verse 13, there's a Greek participle that he uses that is translated as, after you have done, and implying that there is an underlined uh, period of time, either following or in the midst of the evil day. What he's really doing here is he's trying to encourage us that we shouldn't think of that evil day as somewhere in the future, but rather in the present now. Whatever evil there is right now, we need to take up the whole armor of God right now for the present battle not so much for some future battle. This is a daily thing. This is something that we do daily. We, we clothe ourselves with the armor of God as revealed here in Ephesians 6 daily. So from my vantage point, present circumstances across the, across the globe make it pretty evident that Satan and his minions are at work. And that as Christians, we are to be engaged in the spiritual battle by allying ourselves with Jesus. Sickness, death, fear, confusion, anxiety, condemnation are signs of the kingdom of darkness rather than the kingdom of God. And from where I sit, I see signs of that all around me. I want to encourage you in this season, as I would encourage you in any season, 
to lean into Jesus. Jesus, essentially, for us as Christians, is all that we have at any time. All that we have at any time is Him in the moment. Him here and now, and in the next moment, and the next, and the next, and the next. And we surround ourselves with things that, that create the illusion that we have security and safety. But when we're in a season like we are right now, we recognize that those things are purely illusions. Lean into Jesus. For every spirit that disturbs you, take up the opposite spirit. If it's fear and anxiety, then lean into trust. Say it. Say, Jesus, I trust you. You have brought me thus far, and you will see it through to completion. If it's hopelessness, then lean into hope, because you are the hope of the world. Right now, church, you are the hope of the world. The church is the hope of the world. Our hope is in you, Lord. Our hope is in you, and we want to share that hope with others. If your spirit right now is sad, then be free to lament before him, because lament will lead you ultimately in the pattern of the Psalms to praise. Let me close with a thought from the prophet Habakkuk, and I'm going to close by using this as a prayer. So Lord, we say collectively, though the fig tree does not bud, and no fruit is on the vine. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the sheep are cut off from the fold and no cattle are in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Amen and amen. Bless you. Thank you for the word of God. I hope that you are blessed. As we close the service, let's bow our heads. As I pray in Cebuano language, the Holy Spirit will make you understand. Let us pray. The Lord of Dios, Maunga Adlao, Salamat sa Imo Hampulong. Kabalo mi gino nga nakakita ka gino sa mga kasing-kasing sa tagsa-tagsa na mo, pinabuhi, sa tagsa na mo, pamilya. Lord, ang among paglaob, narami mo, God. Wala yun ay mo sa mga galingon, kung wala ka. Lord, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Lord, do doon mini mo uba ng pagpagbos sa mga kasing-kasing Ay mahimo Lord. Salamat sa iyong pulong na pinundum na mo. My hope is in you, Lord God. Wala na mga Diyos. Hangyo, Mitch. Kasamang pagkinabuhi sa tagsa ka pamilya sa vineyard church. Tabuni mi sa balaan ng dugo, God. Tabuni mi ginoo sa iyong balaan ng dugo. Lord, kaya makasiguro mi kaya sa dihang ngayon bala niya dito mga tabun sa among tagsa-tagsa ka pamilya wala ginooy buhat sa yawa na makaabot sa among pamilya Lord, salamat ginoo nga ang tanan nga pamilya sa Binyard Church na ay kalipay kalinaw relax nga kinabuhi relax nga pamilya Bisa ng tibo kalidutan, nagkaguliang sa virus, ang itawa ang corona. Pero Lord, I know you are God, you are great God. There is power in the name of Jesus to protect sa tagsa-tagsa. There is power in the name of Jesus to heal. And there is power in the name of Jesus to bless sa tanan na pamilya ni mga God. All children of God na ay kalina o kalipay pinaagi yun o sa inyo grosya o gugma na ay mong di-promise sa mga awal. So Lord, salamat kayo ng matakum na adlaw sa Domingo God. Lord, amo ginoong ikit ang inyong promise magmadaugon ni kanunay tungod sa inyong ngalan o Lord sa pangalan ni Jesus. Salamat, you know, 
Thank you for everything. Thank you for blessings. Ay mo naging maghatag sa mga ugar. So Lord, ang tanan dungog si Maya, amo lang ibalik sa imong halang doon, buhi o ginangkunon ng ngalan. Ang ngalan ni Jesus na walay katapusan ng ngalan o naa ang dahum. Nagadilaab kami na aron mo na bless yung mga protection sa mga ugar. Lamat o Lord, cover ginoo sa amuang pastor, banyang pamilya. Cover o Lord sa tanan ginoo, Christian family, sa tibuok ginoo kalibutan o God. Salamat Lord sa inyong presensya o God. Binaigun ka, dumog himaya amu ibalik ka nimo, nimao nga adlaw sa Domingo o God. Sa ngalan, sa mahan, sa anak, sa Diyos, sa Espiritu Santo. Ang tanan o Lord. Amen.